This session will be in two parts and it's under the title Living in on the Edge of Credibility. Credibility is increasingly a problem for Christians for several reasons. Firstly, there are a number of attacks, as we're aware, being made by so-called new atheists, skeptics and rationalists who are attempting to launch assaults on the credibility and the rationality of the Christian faith. And also, Christians are on the edge of credibility in some ways. It must be acknowledged partly due to the actions and in particular the misbehaviour of Christians themselves. So certainly in places like Australia, Christians don't enjoy the high reputation they used to hold and they are now considered rather less credible than they were originally. In this presentation I'd like to start looking at some of the challenges to our credibility, in particular those launched by atheism and what is being called the new atheism. I'd like to look at the topic of the new atheism and let's see if we can de define that a little and understand what it really means. Then I'd like to look at some criticism of new atheism not simply by other religious believers or even Christadelphians, but actually criticism by other atheists, which may interest you. And then thirdly, I'd like to look at this interesting question of why it is that actually so many atheists are copying religious people, and in particular why it is that some high-ranking and, and very scholarly and learned atheists are saying that atheists should copy religious people, which may sound rather, rather odd, and we'll see what that means as I get to it later on. The atheism which is being called the new atheism is a position which takes these various views. New atheists believe that science and religion are completely incompatible. They believe that they are, there are no supernatural causes for anything. They believe that science is a reliable guide to morality, despite the fact that the overwhelming majority of scientists say that this is not true. They believe that religion is either dangerous at worst or useless at best. And they believe that religion must be eradicated from public discourse and from society. And this is perhaps one of the most well-known and aggressive aspects of the new atheism. They actually want to stamp out religious belief. It's not enough for them that, that religious people should be separated from political and public discourse. They actually want religious belief to disappear. Several prominent atheists have become well known as examples of and in fact leaders of the new atheism. Richard Dawkins is one of the most well known. Daniel Dennett is another highly well-known and well-written atheist. Sam Harris, who is an ex-Christian in North America, is another very well-publicised new atheist. Christopher Hitchens was a, an English atheist who is actually now dead. We don't have to worry him, about him so much for two reasons. One, he's dead. And another is that uh, he was heavily criticised, in fact, when he was alive, even by other atheists. Victor Stenger is another high-ranking and outspoken new atheist. So these are the names, if you, if you hear about new atheism, these are the names that you'll come across, and these are the authors who are considered to be highly representative of this new, or so-called, new atheist approach. And if you want to become familiar with cutting-edge works on new atheism, these are the authors you need to look at. It's interesting to note, however, about the new atheism, that the name is something of a misnomer. It's a little misleading. Firstly, because the new atheism isn't actually new. And secondly, because the new atheism is, in fact, in some cases, not even real atheism. Uh, some of the most prominent new atheists, in fact, although they certainly reject belief in God, also hold to mystical beliefs which are quasi-religious, which is rather ironic. And even one of the archetypal new atheists Richard Dawkins himself insists that he has never called himself an actual hardline atheist. And on a scale of 
a scale of one to ten, he says he he may be or, or seven to eight. He may be a he may be a seven or an eight out of ten, eight, seven out of eight, or perhaps an eight or nine out of ten. But he is prepared to acknowledge the possibility, however remote as he may believe, that in fact there is a God, and he's not quite a hundred percent ready to con, con, to commit himself to a completely atheist position. What's important to note in terms of the arguments that are being used by New Atheism is that even though these arguments are considered new and novel and, and intriguingly confrontational for Christians, in fact none of the arguments that are being used by the New Atheists are in fact new. And most of the arguments being used are extremely old. So, to give you an idea, these are these are the, uh, the primary authors who are known as representative of New Atheism, Richard Dawkins, Daniel Demet, Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, Victor Stenger. And this is the source of, or at least the, the precursor of the atheist beliefs now being represented as New Atheism. The Kavaka, who are a sceptical anti-religious group in India in the 7th century before Christ. Critias, who was a 5th century Greek philosopher. Epicurus, who was a Greek philosopher three to 400 years before Christ. Lucretius, who was a 1st century writer, a Roman writer. And Cicero, who was a 1st century Roman orator and sceptic and rationalist. You will find that the new atheist beliefs, or the arguments being raised by so-called new atheists, all find their precursor in these earlier groups and these earlier sceptics. There are, in fact, new, no arguments being made by the new atheists, which are, in fact, new. All of the arguments made by the, the so-called new atheists can be found in these earlier ancient writings. And the reason why that is important is not simply to demonstrate that the new atheists are not particularly imaginative, but also because these beliefs, these sceptical beliefs by these earlier writers and groups, have been very well known to Christians for many centuries. And in fact, even the earliest Christians in the 2nd, 3rd and 4th centuries were very, very well aware in particular of the Greek and Roman sceptics and quoted their works and wrote against them. So it's important to understand that the arguments used by the new atheists are not in fact new, and they are arguments which earlier Christians have known and have discussed for centuries and have had very good answers to. So when the new atheist or somebody who is promoting new atheist beliefs comes and confronts you with these arguments, it's useful to ask them firstly, well, I know that to you this argument against Christianity may seem new. It may seem new to you because you haven't heard it before. But I'd like to ask you firstly, if you want to be intellectually honest with me, have you considered the standard Christian replies to the argument that you are presenting to me? And if they say, well actually I thought these were new arguments, I, I wasn't aware that there were any Christian replies to these arguments used by the new, argument, by the new atheists, then it's useful to reply to them in, and answer, well, don't you think that before confronting me with ideas that you've, you've adopted from these new atheists, don't you think that before confronting me with these arguments that you believe are new, you should do perhaps a little bit of homework and see firstly if these arguments really are new, and secondly, have they been answered before by Christians? And then maybe you can come to me firstly with those arguments and secondly with the replies which have already been made by other Christians to these arguments and then you can explain to me why you think perhaps those counter replies, those arguments by Christians aren't satisfactory. But unless you're prepared to come to me with evidence that you are aware that these arguments are not new and evidence that you are aware of the standard Christian replies to these arguments then please don't waste my time. It's a matter of intellectual honesty. These arguments have been answered earlier by Christians and anybody attempting to confront you with these arguments needs to demonstrate that, demonstrate that they are aware of the arguments for and against their own position. 
And the reason why this is important is because this is exactly what they are asking you to do. They are coming to you and saying, well, you know, if you want to be an intellectually honest Christian, if you want to be a morally honest Christian, then you should be prepared to have your faith challenged. And you should know the arguments for and against your own position so that you can make a rational decision as to whether or not your beliefs are true. And you can say, yes, I acknowledge that, that's true. It is good and it's right and intellectually honest for me to know the arguments for Christianity and the arguments against and to weigh them. But by the same token, if you want to call yourself an atheist and say that this is your established position, then you have to do the same thing. And you have to show me that you haven't simply quoted and, and, and assimilated a great bunch of arguments from atheist literature, you have to show me that you've done your homework and that you are aware of and you have examined the standard Christian replies. I want you to show me that you are aware of the arguments for and against atheism before we can have this discussion. Something that we touched on in our previous presentation was the question of whether or not faith is rational. And one of the most commonly used arguments by the new atheists is the argument that faith is irrational. And they, they do that in an attempt to try and make religious believers seem foolish and out of date. They want, us, they want people to think that we don't actually use our brains. But as I've demonstrated to you previously, the overwhelming body of standard, secular, scholarly, professional literature on the question of religion, on the question of the philosophy of religion, and the question of rationality, all agrees, and has agreed for many years, that there are rational grounds for faith, and that it is, is rational to have belief with a body of evidence, even if you don't have conclusive proof. So new atheists who come to you and try to attack your faith as irrational, who try and say you're not really using your brain. If you have faith, you're not using your brain. If you have faith, then you are an irrational person. Those people have actually no factual basis for saying that. And you need to confront them with the evidence that in fact, people who study the concept of rationality and rational thinking for a living, people who are experts in the philosophy of religion, overwhelmingly conclude that it is rational to have faith, and that an evidence-based faith is, in fact, the intellectually honest position of a right-thinking person. Now, what's also ironic is that these new atheists who come to you attempted to claim that atheism necessarily equals rationalism, and that you, if you are an atheist, it necessarily means that you are an entirely highly intelligent and logical and rational believer who doesn't make logical mistakes and who always has rational beliefs, it's important to understand that that is in fact not true. There are plenty of atheists and in particular some highly prominent new atheists who, whilst they have a very strong conviction that their atheism is correct, and while they have a very strong belief that science can lead them into all truth, Nevertheless, hold highly irrational beliefs, beliefs which are in fact not even supported by the science in which they profess to believe. It's important to understand, therefore, that just because you're an atheist doesn't mean you are immune to illogical thought. And just because you're an atheist doesn't mean that everything you believe is automatically going to be intelligent and rational. What I'd like to do now is, is show you some evidence for new atheists, highly prominent new atheists, very outspoken new atheists, who nevertheless hold irrational beliefs. Beliefs which are in fact criticised by many other atheists. Bill Mayer is one of the most prominent and very well known, especially in this country, very well known anti-religious atheists and sceptics. And Bill Mayer is famous for his so-called scientific attacks on religion and especially Christianity. Bill Mayer wants us to believe that, that science has eradicated any necessity for belief in the Bible and any necessity for belief in religion. And Bill Mayer wants us to, wants us to believe that, that science perform, performs the function of guiding us into truth. And the irony is that Bill Mayer has beliefs which are incredibly unscientific. Bill Mayer is sternly against Western medicine. He doesn't believe that vaccinations actually work. He, he doesn't believe that AIDS is actually caused by the HIV virus. And he holds a number of, of other beliefs. He sternly believes that, that, that taking cold medicine is very bad for you. And, and that Western medicine is 
the product of a, a secret conspiracy of people who, who are just trying to warp people's minds and, and take their money. Bill Mayer is sternly against Western medicine, despite the fact that Western med medicine has been supported by overwhelming scientific evidence. And the reason for this is that Bill Mayer is not a rational person. <laughs> Bill Mayer is very happy to use science when it appears to support his beliefs. But as soon as it contradicts him, then he suddenly goes into this irrational spiel about how scientists are in some kind of weird conspiracy, and he prefers Eastern mysticism. This is not, this is not exactly what we would expect of, of a dogmatic atheist, but it, and it's, it's certainly not what we'd expect of somebody who is a, a rational thinker. And Bill Mayer, you can find many, many sites on the internet uh, from far more rationally minded and even moderate atheists speaking out sternly against Bill Mayer and saying he's giving atheists a very bad name because he's so irrational. Ian Plymer is a well-known geologist, geologist in Australia. He is well known for his opposition to religion on religious grounds and especially his outspoken opposition to Christianity on, religious, on, on scientific grounds. And he fancies himself a scientist, well he is a trained geologist, and he attempts to make arguments against Christianity on religious grounds. And he, he confronts Christians with the fact that, as far as he is concerned, the overwhelming body of scientific evidence, as he claims, contradicts Christianity. But like Bill Mayer, Ian Plymer is not so happy with bodies of scientific evidence which contradict his personal views. Ian Plymer denies Climate, cl climate change. He doesn't simply deny that humans are responsible, he denies that the climate is actually changing, which is something which is acknowledged by many people, even if they don't believe that humans are responsible. And it's perhaps no surprise that Ian Plymer denies climate change when you consider that he is a geologist who, in Australia, is consistently and repeatedly hired by the mining industry to try and make arguments that climate change is not happening, which is why they don't need to reduce their carbon emissions. And so, on the scale of intellectual honesty, Ian Plymer scores about a sub-zero. So, Ian Plymer holds irrational beliefs. On the one hand, he believes that science has dis disproved Christianity, and that we can trust scientists when they tell us things. We can trust the scholarly scientific consensus. But on the other hand, when the scientific scholarly consensus contradicts Ian Plymer's personal views, then suddenly, science is a conspiracy, and we can't trust scientists. Ian Plymer is an irrational person. Penn and Teller are, are famous for debunking all kinds of myths and exposing charlatans and ex rightly exposing people such as, as, as uh, uh, false faith healers and people who claim to be clairvoyants. And in many ways they do a good, a good service, but as soon as they start to go up, up against religion and make claims that science contradicts religion, then they run into problems. Despite their strong belief that science has contradicted religion and that we must trust science, they are also known to hold certain irrational beliefs themselves. Like Ian Plymer, until recently, they also denied that any climate change was happening. And they had an entire series on this in their, on their TV program, and they tried to deny it. And when confronted with the scientific body of evidence, they simply pretended it didn't exist, or they claimed, well, we can't trust scientists after all. And likewise, they, they made strong arguments on their program uh, against the idea that tobacco and, and nicotine are, are dangerous. Now, that's extraordinary because this is something that's been extremely well known for decades and has been proved overwhelmingly by the scientific consensus. So, Penn and Teller, like Ian Plymer, like Bill Mayer, are very happy with science when it appears to support their personal beliefs. But as soon as it comes into conflict with their personal beliefs, suddenly they're happy to drop scientists to drop scientists and, and, and call conspiracy and claim that science isn't very reliable after all. Penn and Teller are not rational people. Richard Dawkins, one of the most famous of the new atheists, of course, is particularly well known for his, for his, uh, for his works against religion, especially his, uh, his books against Christianity. Um, very well known in particular for the book he wrote called The God Delusion. And Richard Dawkins argues strongly that religion is useless and that it is dangerous. He argues strongly that, in his opinion, religion should be eradicated from society. His primary argument for doing so is just to, to claim that religion is useless and that it is dangerous. 
Now the irony is, of course, that as many atheists have actually quite recently replied to Richard Dawkins, and as I will demonstrate to you later, the overwhelming body of scientific research and the surveys which have been conducted demonstrate that religion actually is extremely useful. And religion has historically been extremely successful in creating well-organized and harmonious societies. And even scientists who can categorically disbelieve in religion still acknowledge that the reason, one of the reasons why religions continue to function and continue to be believed in in society is because they actually work. They do have a strong function and then they actually provide better life outcomes than non-religion. And that's something that we'll look at in particular. So Richard Dawkins is, is happy to appeal to science when it suits his personal beliefs, but as soon as he has shown evidence demonstrating that religious beliefs are in fact not useless, then he suddenly doesn't want to know. And suddenly he's not so happy about science after all. And that's because religious Daw Richard Dawkins is not a rational person. So now I'd like to look at criticism of the new atheism. And we know, of course, there's a lot of, been a lot of criticism of the new atheism by Christian groups, by other religious groups, and indeed by Christadelphians. But it's not always very useful if you're in a discussion with an atheist friend. It's not always very useful to confront them with criticism from another Christian or a Christadelphian. It's very easy for them to say, well, of course he's going to say that he's a Christian. Oh, okay, he might be a scientist, but, you know, I think his, science is, his scientific conclusions are affected by his Christian belief. What is very useful when we engage the new atheists or people who try and use their arguments, what is very useful is to find and use material which has been written by other intelligent, well-known, well-published atheists who identify weaknesses in the atheist case and who contradict the claims of new atheism and who, although they may be atheists themselves, still acknowledge that atheism is not a position that has proved itself and it must be a position, if it is held at all, which must be held with a certain degree of scepticism. I'd like to quote to you now from a book written by Jacques Belineblau, who's a, a famous European atheist, and he has criticised extensively, the, especially the, the atheist works which have come out of North America recently. And one of his primary arguments is that the new atheists are in fact doing themselves and atheism a disservice because they simply don't know enough. His argument is that the new atheism is ignorant. He wrote a book called The Secular Bible, Why Non-Believers Must Take Religion Seriously. And the reason why he wrote this book is to try and explain to new atheists why they don't seem to be getting anywhere and why their arguments are very easily dismissed by rationally minded and thinking religious people. Now, one of the reasons why many of these new atheists are such irrational people and use such weak arguments is because, it must be acknowledged, they used to be religious themselves. And many of them came from deeply fundamentalist and anti-intellectual Christian groups which didn't encourage a sense of inquiry such as been matured by our community, which didn't encourage an evidence-based approach to faith. And when these people, because they had just been taught for deism, because they had just been taught you have to believe it because the Bible says it or because your, bi your pastor has taught you, when they came into an irreconcilable confrontation between their beliefs and reality, and they were unable to reconcile their beliefs with reality, then their entire worldview collapsed. They had never been given an evidence-based approach to faith. They had been, never been given evidence for their beliefs. And in many cases, their theological beliefs were wrong. They believed in things like the immortal soul. They believed in the Trinity, which you can prove are not even what the Bible teaches. And when they came to that confrontation between reality and their beliefs, suddenly everything collapsed and they had nothing to hold on to. And they very easily became atheists because they, had, they never had a rational ground for faith in the first place. So from, become, from being irrationally minded religious people, they simply became irrationally minded non-religious people. And in many ways their thinking never changed. Their religious, base was, their religious beliefs were never based on evidence and their atheist beliefs are likewise not based on evidence either. And in many cases 
their statements and their claims about the Bible are ignorant because they never knew very much about the Bible to start with. And this is why this man, Jacques Belinoblau, says that one of the major problems with many atheists today is that they are biblically ignorant. They don't know enough about the Bible either because in atheist families they weren't really taught much about the Bible, or they were originally raised as religious people in anti-intellectual communities which did not encourage independent study of the Bible, so they never really learned about it, and in communities which did not encourage an evidence-based faith. So these people very easily were deconverted from one form of belief with no evidence to another form of belief with equally no evidence. So Belinda Blau writes, in all but exceptional cases, today's secularists are biblically illiterate. Truth be told, their repertoire of knowledge about religion in general leaves much to be desired. Now this is of immense value to us because our community, as I've mentioned before, has always prided itself on a strong evidence-based faith and a far more intellectual and academic approach to studying the Bible. And when we are confronted with many arguments by the newer atheists, our better understanding of the Bible allows us to dismiss with ease arguments which otherwise leave many other Christians in turmoil. They can come to us and say, well, of course, the Trinity is completely irrational. This, this belief about the Trinity that three people can, uh, three, one God can be three people, and then you can three, have three people who are all God, but you don't have three gods, that's not <coughs> logically consistent. It's completely irrational. And we say, well, I completely agree. And, and that immediately, immediately takes them back. One of, one of the, apparently one of the best weapons in their arsenals is, is immediately nullified. So they go, well, well, what about the immortal soul? You know, there's no scientific evidence for the immortal soul. Like, oh, I completely agree. That's, that's great news. And, and, and of course, immediately, immediately, the, against a, a biblically informed, a biblically literate believer who has an evidence faith to faith, the great arguments of these new atheists are suddenly completely powerless. And this is something that's very important to understand. As Belinda Blau, and Belinda Blau is writing his book for other atheists, he's saying, you know, if, if you want to take the Bible, you really got to understand what it actually says. And Belinda Blau spends some of his time trying to appeal to these other atheists and say, look, you are wasting your time attacking a straw man. You're wasting your time attacking a shadow. Many so-called orthodox beliefs, he says, simply aren't taught in the Bible at all. And if you meet a biblically literate believer, you are going to be in trouble because they will tie you in knots because they know about what the Bible really says. And Belinda Blau, who was himself a, a biblical scholar, has a much better understanding of the Bible. And, the, and Belinda Blau is the kind of man, being a, a, a biblical scholar, who will acknowledge freely the Bible does not teach the immortality of the soul. The Bible does not teach the Trinity. The earliest Christians did not believe that Jesus was God. He knows this is what the Bible really teaches. He's a, he's a high-end biblical scholar. And he's trying to encourage his, his uh, fellow atheists, please don't confuse what the Bible says with what some ignorant Christians believe the Bible says. And so he says, you know, one of the problems with atheists today is they just don't know the Bible very well. And the other point he makes is that for over a hundred years since the rise of a new kind of secularism in the 19th century, people have been saying that religious belief was going to die out and that, and that religions would suddenly wither away. But he says, contrary to what so many 19th and 20th century social theorists believed and hoped for, the species, the human species, has not abandoned its faith in the divine. Karl Marx's optimism about the impending abolishment of religion was unfounded. So he says, please don't believe all those people who say, oh, who are those atheists who say, oh, don't worry, religion will eventually die out. He says, we've been saying that for over 150 years, still hasn't happened. We need to be realistic about that. So he goes on to say, he goes on to say to his, his fellow believer, his fellow atheists, that religious belief is not in fact dying as had been hoped. And despite the, the statements from, from 19th century and 20th century non-believers, religious belief is not withering on the vine. As he goes, goes on to say, the masses have not turned away from their beliefs with the fatal inevitability of a process of growth, as Sigmund Freud predicted. And know the gods are not growing old and dying, to invoke Emile Durkheim's famous words. He says, look, there's no point in just repeating these mantras and saying, oh, don't worry, people eventually grow out of religion. He says, they're not growing out of religion. And one of the reasons why, as he says, is because there are actually very good reasons for believing in religion. 
And unless you understand what those reasons are, you will never be able to engage believers successfully. On the contrary, he says, in the 20th century and in the 21st century, he says, what's happening now is that religious belief is becoming far more sophisticated. And Belinda Blau identifies this partly as a, as a reason for an increased biblical literacy. Belinda Blau, as a, a very experienced biblical scholar, knows that in among other professional biblical scholars, people who actually go to seminary and people who study the Bible professionally, high-end professional theologians are acknowledging that many beliefs attributed to the Bible are in fact not taught there. It is a consensus of modern Bible scholars that the Trinity is not taught in the Bible. They know the immortal soul is not taught in the Bible. They know the Bible doesn't teach that we go to heaven and hell. They know all these things. And Belinda Blau, as a professional theologian himself, is one of the people who's aware of this. And he says because of this, it's getting a lot more difficult to try and engage the Bible and to try and dispute it because those favourite arguments just don't work anymore because what we were really attacking was beliefs about the Bible which are not even taught in the Bible. And he said, on the contrary, now, as more people come to a better understanding of what the Bible really does teach, it's getting more and more difficult to try and persuade people that the Bible is wrong. It's becoming more and more difficult to try and confront believers. He says, believing intellectuals, in contrast, are thriving once again. And he said, now, despite this rise of science and everything, the arguments used by believers are becoming more and more sophisticated, and they're becoming stronger and stronger. Believers, he says, now draw skillfully on the full range of sciences, social sciences, and humanities. And that's what I, I intend to do this weekend, in fact. And he said, you need to be fully aware that, in fact, the, the growing body of evidence from a better understanding of the Bible and from science, social science, the humanities, is not contradicting what Christians believe. It's actually supporting it. And if you want to be a well-informed atheist, you need to be aware of this. Otherwise, you're going to get absolutely nowhere. In doing so, Belinda Blau goes on to say, their proofs for the existence of God and the importance of belief, ritual, communities of the faithful, and so on, have become increasingly rigorous and coherent. And he says to them, you really have to understand that the new wave of Christian beliefs and the proofs and the arguments for the evidence of God are now becoming stronger and stronger. In fact, what people have expected has been, ha the reverse has happened of what many atheists have expected. As people have come to know the Bible better, and as science has improved in its understanding, Christians have been able to co-opt this new information to make stronger and stronger arguments for the existence of God, and better and more sophisticated arguments for the truth of the Bible. And this is of immense value to us as Bible believers, because in many ways we've been ahead of the game all along. We haven't had to jettison these, these beliefs. We already had a good understanding of the Bible and what it really taught. So these classical arguments used by the new atheists against the immortality of the soul, against Trinitarianism, against hell, they simply don't work on us. And we can take great satisfaction that the same kind of evidence-based arguments from science, from history, and from the, from the humanities and social sciences, those are the same arguments that our community has already always been making. So now what I'd like to look at is this Curious fact, as Belinda Blau and other atheists have acknowledged, in the modern world there has been a growing trend. Whilst it is true that certain forms of religious belief have been declining, and in, fer in fact certain kinds of Christian communities have been declining, especially the very fundamentalist Christian communities which do not have an evidence-based faith, those communities have certainly been, de been declining because their believers are unable to support their arguments through evidence. And that is not the case of our community. But while it is true that certain religious groups and certain Christian groups are declining in numbers, it is also true that certain other forms of religious belief and other, certain other religious communities, such as ourselves, are holding our own and we are continuing to successfully convert people because we have a different approach to faith. We have an evidence-based faith. Along with that, it is also a fact that, especially in the 20th century, 
more atheists are now starting to look at religious communities and realize that they are doing something right and that, that we, they need to start copying them in order to try and get the same advantages that we have. It's absolutely true, if we have an evidence-based faith, it's absolutely true that we should expect to find that what the Bible says about following God's instruction is really true. The Bible tells us simply that if we follow God's commandments and have faith in God, then it not only will we have hope and faith in the resurrection and in the kingdom when Christ returns, but we will have better outcomes also in this life. And you can read the, the book of Proverbs and the book of Ecclesiastes as classic examples of that. The wisdom of the Bible guides us to a better way of life even before the return of Christ. Especially all the Proverbs with, which David and Solomon wrote to their sons, exhorting them that biblical instruction results in better life outcomes. And in recent years there has been considerable scientific study of this question. Is it really true that religious belief provides benefits and better life outcomes and the fact is it does numerous studies have demonstrated the strong advantages of religious belief increased levels of education lower crime rates higher rates of civil involvement and higher levels of cooperation within society increased <coughs> increased levels of increased levels of marital satisfaction lower divorce rates better outcomes for children and youth, and health and longevity benefits. All of these benefits are associated with people who have a strong religious belief and who are actively involved in their religious community. Now this is the number one hurdle for new atheists. If religion is so bad, then why is it so good for us? If This is exactly what we would expect if the Bible's message is true. If there is a God who is an intelligent, divine, heavenly Father who is giving us good instruction about how to live our lives, then it should be demonstrable that our life outcomes will be better than those people who don't believe. And the overwhelming number of scientific studies indicates that this is true. Many studies have documented the beliefs of religious involvement. Indeed, highly religious people tend to be healthier, live longer, and have higher levels of subjective well-being. Note that highly religious people. People with a weak faith, who are less involved with their religious communities, don't tend to enjoy these kind of benefits. And in fact, some studies indicate that they might as well be atheists, because they are not enjoying the same kind of benefits. It's people who have a strong faith, people who understand what they believe in, who have good reasons for their faith, who aren't wavering or weak, who don't go to, to church on Sunday just because they think it's the right thing to do, or just because it makes them a good person. People who understand what they believe, and people who really deeply believe it, and who are actively involved in a regular basis with members of their religious community. Conservative religious communities such as ours, we get these benefits. Religious participation has also been associated with better educational outcomes, which is the complete opposite of the typical charge by atheists that the more religious you get, the more stupid you get, and the less education you have. Not only that, but several studies, this, this study goes on to say, several studies have documented an association between religion and children's well-being. That's particularly important for people like uh, Richard Dawkins, who has referred to religion as child abuse. Overall, this study says, we find strong evidence that youth with religiously active parents are less affected later in life by a childhood disadvantage, such as broken homes or poverty, than youth whose parents did not frequently attend religious services. So even children who are in a bad social situation or have, have bad family situations are less affected later in life by those situations because their religious community and their religious involvement and their religious beliefs helps guide them and protect them and lead them in a better way. Well, what about other forms of social help that you could give them? What about secular support from 
youth, youth, uh, youth circles or secular support from youth drop-in centres or other social organisations. Well, this study says, well, actually, we generally find much weaker buffering effects for other social organisations. In other words, secular methods of dealing with disadvantaged youth don't result in the same kind of successful outcomes as religious organisations. Religious organisations are doing something better. They are giving young people who are disadvantaged something that provides much better effect and much better life outcomes than secular assistance. And that is remarkable. That means secular solutions do not have the best answer for these children's problems. That is very important to note. Another study. Several studies show that religious involvement is generally associated with health-promoting behaviours. Now, you can look all the way back to the earliest literature in our community, back to the, some, even some of the, uh, the letters and some of the, uh, the, the writings of Brother Thomas and Brother Roberts, even before our first Christadelphian magazine was established. And they were always encouraging a good, healthy life. In fact, our community, for example, has always been very strongly, from its earliest days, has been very strongly against, against tobacco smoking, for example, which was, uh, so it must be acknowledged, something of a concern to some of the earlier brothers who were, in fact, uh, tobacco farmers in Virginia. And, and it's, it's, it's a, an actual fact that you can find a little bit of debate in that in, in some of the early Christadelphian literature. But our, our community came out strongly in the idea that, that putting, something into, putting something into your mouth and inhaling smoke just didn't seem like the best idea for your health. And we were right. So religious involvement is generally associated with health-promoting behaviours. And such behaviours explain, at least in part, the connection between religion and longevity. And we know that the, the children of Israel were told by Moses and through God, by, told by God through Moses that when they entered the land of Canaan, if they obeyed the law of Moses, they would enjoy a good life and they would prosper and live long in the land. And one of the, re one of the reasons for this was that the law of Moses provided excellent guidance on health and hygiene regulation, which were far in advance of the, the other nations of the day. So we can prove that the Bible gives us good advice about health-promoting behaviours. And this, again, is evidence that it was written by somebody who really knows what they're talking about. Again, surveys have shown, have long shown, that religious believers in the United States are happier, healthier, long-lived, and more generous to charity and to each other than secular people. And most of these effects have been documented in Europe as well. And this is, this is a quotation from, uh, from Jonathan Haidt, who is a, uh, an atheist, but a, a very well-recognised psychologist, social psychologist. And he says simply, if you believe that morality is about happiness and suffering, then I think you are obligated to take a close look at the way religious people actually live and ask what they are doing right. And he wrote, he wrote this article, and in fact, later he wrote also a book explaining that many people have really got, un, un, uh, got a wrong understanding of religion, and that one of the reasons why religion is still popular today is it actually works. And if atheists want to really understand and try and oppose religion, they need to understand exactly what they're opposing, and perhaps not a good idea to dismantle something which is actually working so well, especially when the only alternative doesn't work very well at all. Now, you will see a lot of these quotations have spoken in general terms about the benefits of religion. And it's true that most of these effects have been very well documented in the Christian community. But, as we have to do if we're going to be intellectually honest with ourselves, we might say, well, religion certainly provides benefits to life. But what we need to do as Christians, as Bible believers, as people who have a true understanding of the Gospel, what we have to do is demonstrate that Christianity and particular the true gospel is uniquely positioned to provide benefits that other religions do not provide. And this is something we need to really be honest about. Yes, it's true that some form of religious belief provides certain kind of benefits, but it's also true that certain forms of religious belief provide better benefits than other forms. And what we need to do is gather and present the evidence showing that Christian beliefs, and in particular true Christian beliefs, provide the best life outcomes. Now, fortunately, there has been a lot of research done on this, 
And in fact, this has been an ongoing question since Christianity's earliest years. And I'd like you to quote you now from some writings by a man called Aristides. Aristides the Athenian was writing in the second century, and he was explaining, he actually wrote a letter in defense of the Christian religion. It was a letter written to explain to people why he had converted from Greek paganism to Christianity. And he said, as far as he was concerned, Christianity was a higher and better form of religion which had distinctly better life outcomes than paganism. And in his letter he described all the ways in which Christianity was superior to paganism and resulted in a better way of thinking, a more moral life and better life outcomes. He says paganism worships the creation but Christianity worships the creator. Paganism practices evil such as infanticide, but Christianity forbid, forbids infanticide. Paganism disregards the poor, whereas, whereas Christianity encourages care for the poor. Paganism disregards the weak, whereas Christianity cares for the weak. In paganism, the gods can die, which seems particularly inconvenient for somebody who's supposed to worship. And where in Christianity, God cannot die. Paganism is split into all these many small gods with their various little powers and, 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 and demarcation disputes. Whereas in Christianity there is only one great God who knows and does everything. In the same way, he said, in paganism, the gods repeatedly tease humans and, and the Greek mythology is full of, of the gods making fun of humans and providing tests which are simply for the gods' amusement. Whereas in Christianity, God pities humans and cares for them. In paganism, the gods are actually made from nature and, and, and gods come out of mountains and trees. Whereas in Christianity, God is above nature because he created all things. Paganism worships idols as gods, whereas Christianity rejects idols and understands that they are nothing. Paganism, Aristides astutely noted, specifically justifies human vice. And this was a big issue for, Christian, for, for Aristides, one of the primary reasons for his conversion. He could see that the Greek mythology that he used to follow was particularly designed to justify all the things that people really wanted to do. And we see this, of course, in the Old Testament. Is it any surprise that the Canaanite beliefs were structured in the way they do? Is it any surprise that the worship of Baal included a list of things which would be, could basically be summed up as, how about you have a great time? And you know, the Ten Commandments of Baal included, really enjoy yourself, do everything you really like, and that thing you really want, why don't you get it? So it's not really a surprise that pagan beliefs were designed to encourage you to enjoy yourself, because that wasn't the entire point of them. They were simply religious excuses to do all the things you wanted to do anyway. Whereas Christianity, in sharp contradistinction, condemns human vice. Therefore, in paganism, there was no concept of a rebirth, of a, of a new walk, of a change of life. No moral change was required whatsoever. You just kept on doing all the things you wanted to do in the first place. Paganism simply gave you a religious justification for doing them. Christianity, on the other hand, says Aristides, requires a moral change. Consequently, Aristides concluded, and one of the greatest proofs that he had for his conversion of, to Christianity Paganism produces an immoral life, which, if everybody practiced it, would result in a degradation to society. Christianity, he says, produces a moral life. And if everyone practiced Christianity, we would be a lot better off, better off, and so would society. So very early on, Christians were actually using this argument. And this is remarkable because, as we can see, the fundamental argument that Aristides is using here is Christianity results in better life outcomes and better outcomes for society. Now he was making that argument long before there was scientific evidence available for it. But he could see this was true even in his own experience. And what is remarkable is that Christians nearly 2,000 years ago are making evidence, were making arguments that we can now substantiate, fortunately and gratefully, through the significant amass of, mass of scientific evidence and surveys now available to us. So these, these early Christians were making cutting-edge cutting edge arguments which have now been significantly substantiated and proved by modern scientific research. But he could see this was true, even back in the day. Now it's also true that 
that what happened is that, that pagan writers were very much in conflict with Christianity, especially the learned and well-educated uh, pagan writers, and they actually ridiculed Christianity, and they didn't like it, and they tried to stamp it out. The pagan Roman poet Lucian, in the second century, ridiculed Christians. He said, I, I can't understand the things they do. They do the, do the, do the most bizarre things. He said, they actually, you know what they do? They actually go around helping people. Who does that? And he said, the earnestness with which the people of this religion help one another in their needs is incredible. They spare themselves nothing for this end. And he says, their first lawgiver put it into their heads that they were all brethren. What a bizarre idea. <coughs> in in a pagan Roman society, you just didn't do this. Your lines of association, the people that you did good to, were people who could do something back for you. You stayed very much within your own, own social sphere and your own social class. And if you did good for people, it was because you expected something back. You had no moral obligation to people who were unrelated to you, or who were not in your social class, or who couldn't do anything for you in return. You had no moral obligation for them. And you can find plenty of pagan writers who would tell you this. And Lucian was ridiculing the Christians. This, this, this guy told them they were old brothers. What a weird idea. And look what they do. They actually help. They just help anybody. They, do, they do gratuitously help people. And he couldn't understand why they were doing this. Because it involved something which was entirely foreign to his way of thinking. And that was the concept of sacrifice. And as we know, that is one of the fundamental principles of Christianity as it is taught truly in the scriptures and embodied in our Lord Jesus Christ. Sacrifice and the concept that we should love other people even if they aren't related to us, even if they aren't Christians. We know God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ encourages us in many, many parables, most notably the parable of the Good Samaritan, to provide and show that love to others. And we, were, we are encouraged throughout the New Testament to preach through Jesus' own example. So the early pagan writers found this was, was an absolutely bizarre idea and they could not understand. They could not understand why Christianity was thriving when it was doing something which was so encouraging, something which is so incredibly inconvenient. Why convert to this religion which makes you actually do something for other people, especially when they can't do something for you back? Pagan writers were completely baffled by this and they could not understand why, why Christianity was succeeding in the face of all odds. And this is a very important point. Social historians have noted that in the time when Christianity was being suppressed the most, and when it was being opposed by pagan writers and even by emperors, Christianity succeeded because it provided better life outcomes than all other religions available. Christians were, supported each other, and they also supported other people. And it became extremely difficult for pagan neighbours to persecute people who were looking after them and who actually cared for them, even though they weren't even Christians. And Christians were the people who started, who started establishing hospitals. And it was Christians who, when the, the early plagues came through Rome, it was Christians who would stay in the cities and care for everybody and care for the sick, even if they were non-Christians. And of course Christianity grew because pagans found it extremely difficult to, to, to try and suppress or to speak badly against people who were being generous to them and who were, and who, who were looking after them when they were sick and who demonstrably had better life outcomes. Now, by the 4th century, a pagan emperor arose after the Christian religion had been well established. An emperor arose called Julian, known as Julian the Apost sometimes known as Julian the Apostate, because he was raised a Christian but later apostatized and became pagan, sometimes known simply as Julian the Pagan. And he tried to turn back the Roman Empire to the pagan beliefs. He persecuted the Christians and he, he tried to shut the churches and he tried to turn people back to the good old gods, the good old ways of our fathers. He tried to revive paganism. But it was too late. And one of the reasons why it was too late was it was already very clear that people were converting to Christianity because they could see it worked. When Christians told them Christian, that, that following the commandments of the Bible actually give you a better life, it actually did. And paganism was simply, had simply no competition whatsoever. Now, one of the things that, that Julian found, which infuriated him, was that another reason why people were converting to Christianity and why people didn't want to persecute Christians 
was because they were just so nice. And people found it extremely difficult to persecute charitable people who would look after you even though you were a pagan when you were sick. And also, what Julian discovered, much to his horror, was that pagan religions and the pagan priests simply weren't doing this. And he actually wrote a letter addressed to the pagan priests saying, you know, uh, one of the major issues we have here is a PR problem. <laughs> he said, <clears throat> he said, while pagan priests neglect the poor, the hated Galileans, that is his name for Christians, are devoted to works of charity. He says, it is shameful that our people, pagans, should be lacking our assistance. He said, see there the Christians, see the Christians communal meals and their tables spread for the poor. Such practice is common among them and it causes a contempt for our gods. And in fact, in this letter, Julian was, was so upset, he actually sent the pagan priests, I've got to put it to you bluntly, you've got to start copying these guys. Pagan priests need to start making hospitals and involving themselves in charitable works. You need to start copying these guys because right now we are getting walked over. He said, unless we start to adopt the Christian mode of behaviour, unless we start doing what they, they do, then I'm sorry, we are simply no competition. Unfortunately, it was very, very difficult for Julian to try and overturn centuries of, of selfish pagan belief. And after Julian, after Julian died, his entire endeavour collapsed. And this was the last attempt that anybody made to revive the Roman pagan religion. After this, paganism was dead and buried. And the reason why it was dead and buried is because people could see that Christians who were living the Christian life had better life outcomes and that Christianity was, in fact, better for society than other religions. And people, people could see it all that, all that time ago. People could see that nearly 2,000 years ago. And now we have an enormous amount of, of evidence from recent scientific scholarly studies that supports that. And that is definitely a message that we should be getting out there. So these scientific studies of religion, the recent scientific studies, the recent academic and scholarly literature, it's all on our side. And it's only proving that what Christians were doing in the first place was exactly the right thing. And we really need to also take note of this. We really need to take note of the incredible impact that the Christian life and Christian charity, Christian volunteerism had on those early pagans. And we really need to incorporate that into our walk. And I think Christadelphians historically have been very good at important, in, in, including charitable works and, and volunteerism into our walk. And particularly in North America, I know we have a number of very good Christian charity organisations. And that's something we really need to be aware of. Now, uh, Brother Chris mentioned that that's something that, that I'm very involved in Taiwan. And and that was something that I was involved in, in in Australia even before I came to Taiwan. I was involved, for example, in a, a local government program providing free English tuition to migrants, helping to welcome them into the community and, and to make them feel at home, make them feel comfortable. I was a neighbourhood buddy for uh, a young Chinese guy who had recently come to Australia and I was helping him to learn English and helping him feel welcome into the community and, and to feel that, that, he was, that people wanted him to be, th be there and, and that this was now his home as well as mine. And this is something which is extremely important. It's something that we know we are commanded to do by Christ. And it's something we really need to find ways to incorporate in our daily walk. And in Taiwan, it's expected of Christians. Many Christians are involved in charity and volunteer work in Taiwan. And non-Christians in Taiwan expect, they naturally expect, that this is something that Christians do. Because Christianity has such a good reputation. And also, by doing this work in, in Taiwan, I get an opportunity to meet people who are other Christians and who are interested in talking about the Bible. And I also give a, give a witness to Christian belief to non-Christians and get them interested in why I'm doing this, why I'm involved in this. And I, it's a very good way to introduce them to the concept of the Gospel and following Christ. Now, it's remarkable that in those ancient times, in so around 2,000 years ago, pagans and non-believers saw that Christianity was so beneficial that they had to start copying it, even if they didn't convert. That's remarkable because in the modern era now, just as new atheists are trying to tell us that Christianity and religion are irrelevant, and just as they're trying to tell us that Christianity should, should roll up in a corner and die, what is happening now is exactly what was happening nearly 2,000 years ago. 
Some outspoken religion, um, atheists, such as uh, Jacques Berliner Blau, and in particular a man in England called Alain de Botton, is arguing that atheists need to take, sit down and take a good look at religion and understand that religion works. And if you don't, even if you don't want to convert to a religion, at the very least what you need to do is start copying the way religious people live because the way they live is much, has much better life outcomes than non-religious people. And so, I'd now like to introduce you to uh, this man, Alain de Botton, who wrote a book called Religion for Atheists, a non-believer's guide to the uses of religion. And he was arguing directly against new atheist claims that religion is useless and harmful. He said, no, no, look, we just can't use that argument and remain credible. All the overwhelming sociological studies, all the overwhelming scientific evidence shows clearly that religious people have better life outcomes than we do. What we really need to do is sit down and look at this and think, well, why is this? What are we doing wrong? What are they doing right? And he said that even if you don't want to convert, then what you need to do at a bare minimum is start copying what religious people do and how Christians in particular lead their lives. Now, I'm using de Botton because... Although he is a philosopher with a very broad experience of many religions and has wrote on many aspects of religious faith, out of all those religions, de Botton points to Christianity as the one that atheists should copy because it demonstrably has the best life outcomes. And that gets back to our question of, well, okay, scientific studies show religious belief is useful and, and it has better life outcomes, but how is that a selling point for Christianity? Well, what's the selling point is because ben, men like de Botton have acknowledged that of all these religions, Christianity is way ahead of the pack in terms of better life outcomes. So he says the, modern, the era of modern atheism has been to overlook how many aspects of the faiths remain relevant, even after their central tenets have been dismissed. And what he's saying is, look, I don't care if you don't believe in their gods and you, and you think their religious beliefs are false. The, po the problem is, even after you take out all the religious stuff, the stuff they do is still really, really good. It's still relevant and it still results in better life outcomes. How can you expect to convert people by tell to atheism by telling them your religious is nonsense and you shouldn't believe it? How can you expect to convert people when even after you take away all the religious stuff, all those commandments that they, they follow, still result in better life outcomes. That's a non-starter. That's a product you just can't sell. You can't tell someone to, to walk away from a life that is demonstrably providing immense benefits. He said, what we really need to do is stop arguing with these people and start copying them. So he says, <clears throat> religions have wisely insisted that we are inherently flawed creatures. We're incapable of lasting happiness. We're beset by troubling sexual desires. We're obsessed by status. We're vulnerable to appalling accidents. And we are always slowly dying. He, he surveys all the key problems, the challenges, the personal concerns that the average man on the street has. He says, all these problems that we have, even as atheists, these problems that we face, these emotional problems, these philosophical problems, he said, you know what? The point is, religion has already answered those problems. And we as atheists are blundering around trying to find out in our unbelief how do we can settle these things. He said, religion, people, they've already got a grip on all this stuff. And we need to be honest and acknowledge that, that humans, although we might be so wonderful and, and wise and rational, the best and most intelligent creatures on the planet, we really need to acknowledge what religious people have understood all along. That as human beings, we've got some serious issues that we need to face up to. And religious people have found ways of dealing with those issues. So he goes on to explain how, in particular, I think, out of the many points that Berliner Blau, uh, that, the, that, de Botton, that de Botton quotes, and you'll find many of them in, in my book that I, have, that I have over there, one of the points that I found most remarkable, this deep insight that he has for Christianity in particular, is he says that Christianity has a way of dealing with wrongdoing which is far more effective than any secular alternative. He said the thing about Christianity is it starts by dealing with wrongdoing by addressing what goes on in your heart and mind before you even act. He said, wow, that's incredible. He said, you know what Christianity does? It actually tries to pin down the problem at the source. 
Christians actually understand where the problem lies. The problem is not with the environment. The problem is not the way you grew up. The problem is not actually with somebody else. The problem is with you. It's inside you. And he said Christianity actually identifies correctly where the problem lies and tries to deal with it. He said what Christianity does to solve crime is it tries to convert your way of thinking so you don't do it in the first place. Then he says, now compare that to the secular alternative. Consider, he says, by contrast, how belatedly and how bluntly the modern state enters, enters our lives with its injunctions. The state intervenes when it's already far too late, after we've picked up the gun, stolen the money, lied to the children, or pushed our spouse out the window. He said, the whole point, he says, that secular society has no answer to issues such as immorality and crime because it's starting at the wrong end. All we're doing is clean up. We have no secular answer, he said. We've got no secular answer to where the problem really lies. He says, Christianity tackles this head on. It says, I'm sorry, you've got to start thinking differently. Here's the problem. You have to convert hearts and minds in order to solve, to, to solve the ills of society. That's a remarkable insight. And it's from an atheist. And he's telling you that this is one of the key advantages of Christianity. That is remarkable because... When you read de Bonnell's, de Bonnell's work, and especially things like this, you'll find there are deep similarities with the teachings of Christ. It's Christ who tells you that it's already too late after you've committed the, the sin. It's Christ who tells you that, don't worry about, forget about being punished for adultery. He says, if you, even if you look on a woman and start lusting after her, he says, it's already too late. You've already committed the, son, the sin. That's where you need to address the issue. When you start coveting, that's where the problem lies. And so it's this way of thinking that the Christianity, that the Bible itself attempts to renew. It deals with the problem because it actually understands where the problem lies. And the reason why the Bible is so good at understanding where the problem lies, and the reason why the, problem, the, the Bible is so good at, at identifying the, the, uh, the solution to the problem, is it's written by the person who actually made us. And so this is what we find. We find that the secular solutions are no solutions at all because they weren't written by the people who made us. The secular solutions aren't a solution because they simply don't understand what makes us tick. The Bible is a solution because it was actually known by, written by somebody who knows us literally inside out. It was written by somebody who actually knows what he's talking about because, you know, he's God and he knows that kind of thing. And then it was written by a person who is a divine, heavenly father. And when we read the Bible's instruction, we find it's good for us. And isn't that what we expect, brothers and sisters? Isn't that what we should expect? If that book was written by someone who's really alive, who really knows what he's talking about, who really is a divine and wise, loving, heavenly father, shouldn't we expect that he would give us good guidance in our lives? And it is good guidance. And all the modern studies in recent years have demonstrated that it's good guidance. And it is so good guidance that now, as we can see, atheists are starting to copy it. And that's why we can have faith in the Bible. That's why we can have faith in the Bible's moral instruction, as I'll show to you later. And this is definitely the kind of message we need to get out. Not just to our other fellow Christians who may be struggling with their faith, not only to the atheist and the sceptic, but in particular to our young people. In particular to our young people, brothers and sisters. They need to know this. They need to know that Christianity is so good now that atheists are trying to copy it, trying to figure out how does this thing work? And, and the reason why, that, why it works is because it was written by somebody who really is alive, who is a loving the Heavenly Father and who actually knows how to bring up children well.